So I'll tell you what, uh, what we do and what we, why we do the, the, the work uh, uh, we're doing. Certainly this is a uh, forum uh, um, caregivers that uh, I don't have to stress, st uh, stress much the importance of, um, of education and, um, and research um, in order to improve the life of uh, people that we care for. Um, in this case, uh, uh, older uh, adults. Um, so the, the Barshop Institute uh, is part of the UT Health Science Center, and it has been uh, in uh, place since uh, 2001. And um, our, our focus is on um, education uh, and research and, and care of older adults. So why aging? Um, the number of people that are um, living longer uh, is increasing because of improved health care. Um, by uh, 2050, um, the population uh, of adults that are 85 or higher will, will, will triple. Uh, and, um, and the population of people that are 100 years old and, uh, uh, and above will increase about seven times. So um, our objective is to um, understand um, the aging process in order to promote healthy aging. So um, we want that people as they age to um, age in a healthier way, physically, uh, psychologically, uh, uh, and socially. And uh, we do uh, are interested in uh, uh, and do uh, research to promote a, a longer, longer uh, lifespan, a, a longevity, but the, the key is that we want people to age in a way that it's uh, healthier and uh, reduced um, disability. How, uh, so to, in order to do this, uh, uh, we have our, our, our mission that is very clear. First of all, we need to understand uh, aging from a biologic uh, standpoint, and just think about this for a second. For, for many years, it was thought that um, aging was not a, uh, a regulated process, um, that essentially aging just meant that um, our cells, our tissues, our bodies just started working uh, uh, properly. It w and, and then uh, it would become uh, dysfunctional. But this was just uh, thought to be just a random uh, uh, process. Uh, but now we know that um, our cells and our tissues and our, and our body controls the rate by which we age. Uh, and there are situations in which aging can be slowed down and it could be uh, uh, accelerated. Um, and certainly that has been demonstrated at experiments in cell cultures and small animals. And, we, uh, and our idea is to try to un uh, understand what uh, makes, uh, what controls how we age. And again, our objective is to promote uh, aging uh, that is uh, healthy and in order to improve the life of people and, and their families. So we do a lot of research on, it, uh, on aging in the basic laboratory. Um, uh, but we are uh, now in recent years been able to transition rapidly to begin uh, a, a research that um, is be beginning to, to, to test uh, uh, some of our uh, ideas and theories uh, and, uh, in people. And I'll tell you about some of the inroads that we made r regarding research in, in, in human populations. Uh, another uh, key mission that we have is also to train the next generation of uh, educators and clinicians and scientists in aging and geriatric uh, medicine. We have a very active program not only educating researchers, but also physicians uh, and nurses and other healthcare providers, and that it is with, through our colleagues in the VA and the university. Um, how do we do this? How, where do we get our, our money to do this? Well, thankfully, the, the, the university does, through this, the state of Texas provide us with some uh, support to, to, for our programs, but we actually get substantial support from uh, federal government from the National Institutes on Aging, in, in which we uh, 
um, they uh, fund our, our programs through several um, um, mechanisms uh, that are listed here. Um, these are uh, competitive programs in which we need to uh, get, uh, request money for our research and education programs and compete with other uh, top universities uh, in the country. Um, one a program is called the San Antonio Intervention Testing Program, and this is essentially um, t testing different uh, 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 compounds, um, 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 supplements, medications in mice to see whether, uh, and we give them uh, this compound throughout their life to see whether they, it makes them age uh, uh, in a healthier way from a functionally and not, but also in the, their lifespan. Uh, we have another program called the Na San Antonio Nathan Shock Center. Dr. Nathan Shock was uh, one of the pioneers in aging research, and then there's this program that bears his name. And that uh, pro is a program in which we, uh, 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 we can also treat different uh, uh, animals uh, with different uh, uh, compounds and interventions and see whether we can improve how they age. And more recently, a couple of years ago, we competed successfully uh, um, for a program that uh, is designed to uh, begin studies in human subjects. So we can uh, bring some of the discoveries we and, other, and our colleagues from other universities are making in the basic laboratory and with animals and start doing some of these uh, initial pilot studies in, in human uh, uh, subjects. Um, so what type of um, 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 uh, uh, research models we use, and I'll, I'll show, uh, they're, they're shown here. Uh, on the top left, that's a small worm called C. elegans. And you say, why are we, uh, why are we uh, testing uh, uh, worms? Who cares about worms? But actually, the, the, way, the reason why we, we study them is that we can manipulate them uh, uh, and evaluate their manipulations very rapidly. For example, there are some genes, you've probably heard, that are families in which people live many, many years. And this comes uh, is for genetic predisposition. And, uh, and there are some genes that have been um, identified that are called longevity genes. But then you want to say, well, I want to test this. Uh, no, it's very difficult to test to do this, let's say, a genetic mutation in a patient and then wait 100 years to see if it lives longer, right? <laughs> Even in a rodent, it's tough because it might take um, um, you know, five to seven years, and most of our students, they don't want to wait five or seven years, they want to graduate. But these little guys, <laughs> but the worms uh, live less than a month. So you can do a mutation and then see how it affects their life. And now through, um, there are some sophisticated ways to test not only if they live longer or live shorter, but whether they are healthier. We can measure how they move, how they eat, et, et cetera. So it's, uh, it, uh, it's a nice uh, way to study the uh, contribution of genetics on, uh, on aging. Then there's other funny looking uh, uh, rodent with long teeth. That's, that's called a naked mole rat. It's not a true rat, it's actually a different type of rodent. That's its name, naked mole rat, and it comes from the Horn of Africa, and we have a colony here in, in San Antonio. And we uh, study it because even though it's, it's the size of a mouse, you know, a mouse lives two to three years in, in captivity. These animals live 30 years. Um, so uh, the, uh, we want to uh, understand what is it about their biology that makes them uh, live so long. There are only two, even though uh, an, a, mice and rats do get cancer, that's the reason why they typically die. These naked mole rats, we, there are only two cases uh, of cancer. So there's something about them that really makes them um, uh, 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 very healthy and live longer. We're trying to learn from them. Then there's another uh, 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 animal there that looks like, it is a monkey, it's called a, a marmoset, and those come <clears throat> from South America. And the reason we study uh, the marmosets is that um, it's a good model if you want to do a, a test, a model that is not a mouse, 
you have your, let's say you have your findings from a mouse, you want to perhaps begin testing it in humans, but you're not ready and say, well, let's test it in a monkey first. Um, typically, a, a monkey like a baboon or most uh, other um, models live like 30 or 40 years, so it is somewhat difficult to also do uh, longevity studies. But these uh, animals live 10 years. So if we can start a study, let's say by the th when they're six or seven years, and through a course of five years, uh, uh, see whether we, our intervention, it could be a diet or exercise or a drug, can make them uh, age healthier. And finally, as I said, uh, we're beginning to do more and more studies uh, in human subjects. Now, um, what is, uh, no, why are we also interested in, 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 in aging um, from a biological standpoint? Uh, well, it's because a very important risk factor for uh, many diseases. So shown there is uh, a figure that uh, displays um, the uh, increased risk that different factors convey on cancer. So for example, smoking, alcohol, diet, infections, they increase the risk of cancer between 10 to 30, 30%. But let's see the effect of aging. If we put aging in this figure, the risk of age, the contribution of aging to the risk of cancer is so large that it really uh, uh, obscures uh, all the other factors. So it's much more important from a biologic standpoint. This is Alzheimer's disease, different risk factors, um, sex, so, so uh, females have a higher uh, risk for Alzheimer's, diabetes, physical inactivity. There's a gene mutation called APOE. Um, I'll give you some examples of, uh, of, uh, of the research that we're doing. Um, and at the end, I know this is a caregiver summit, so I'll talk also about, very briefly, about one project on uh, caregiver burden. Um, one of the uh, most, um, uh, uh, important research that has been done in the field is with a drug um, called uh, rapamycin. And uh, it, it's called rapamycin because this compound, uh, it was discovered many years ago in the island of Rapa Nui, where those statutes are, because the, the, the substance was uh, discovered there, they called it rapamycin. And it's actually made by uh, uh, a fungus uh, in the island, and it fungus makes this uh, substance to kill bacteria. So in order to fight off bacteria, the fung makes it. So uh, drug companies discovered it. That's what they do. They go to all different places, take samples, and see if they can make new drugs of, of what they find. So first they tried, they developed this drug to, uh, as an antibiotic. But it, uh, it wasn't very effective, but then they started testing it for other diseases, and turns out it's a very effective drug uh, to um, prevent rejection after uh, a transplant of a solid organ. So there are many patients that after a kidney transplant, liver transplant, etc., they take this drug because it's very uh, e efficient to prevent rejection. It also is efficient at, against certain cancers. Um, but uh, there was this notion for uh, that r r rapamycin also may have some effects on on, um, on aging, so um, uh, our university um, and with some colleagues started testing it in, in mice. So what they first did is they gave uh, old mice, they fed them rapamycin, both females and males, and they uh, see whether it affects their longevity. And that is shown in this figure. Um, to your left is uh, the data from males and to your right is data from females. And this is called a, a lifespan curve. Um, at the beginning of the, of the curve, to your left, all the animals are uh, alive. 100% of the animals are alive. And as you move to your right, and days go by and animals start uh, dying, uh, the curve starts uh, going down. So uh, a normal curve is uh, the one that says control, which is kind of in dark blue. So over time, more and more mice uh, are dying. And the same occur for humans, flies, uh, elephants. They all look the same in the shape, in and, and, and the shape how it goes down. So the normal curve is the one in dark um, uh, blue. And you can see is that rapamycin actually uh, extended the lifespan. The rate by which the animals were dying 
uh, both in the males and the females was slowed down with a drug. Um, and this was discovered about seven years ago. And it was the first time that, um, it ever uh, in science that a drug actually had been shown to uh, uh, slow, uh, slow down aging. There had been s s uh, studies for many, many years showing that certain interventions, particularly calorie restriction, um, can make any, uh, uh, rodents uh, um, live longer and have lower, uh, num uh, less diseases, but a drug had never been shown. So this was the first time, and it really became a breakthrough uh, discovery. Um, Science, which is a top scientific journal in, in the world, really highlighted this as a major uh, uh, discovery. Well, you say, well, you know, they're living longer, but are they healthier? So it turns out, uh, subsequently, our, gr our, our, our group and many others around the world uh, started testing it on diseases. And it, it turned out that r rapamycin indeed uh, um, uh, delays Alzheimer's disease in, uh, in animals, uh, improves cognition, uh, slows down and prevents many cancers, also decreases cardiac disease, um, is beneficial from stem cells that we have in our body, uh, and improve uh, um, other things. It's not all good. There is some evidence that it, in some uh, cases, it may make diabetes worse. So it, um, that's something that uh, our group and others are looking uh, very carefully. But it was the first major step because the first time that there was something that can perhaps uh, improve uh, the aging process. Um, so as I said, uh, we eventually want to move to humans, but um, a, a middle uh, a step could be monkeys. So we, are, we have a study funded also by uh, uh, the National Institute uh, of Health uh, on marmosets. So we have about 150 marmosets that we're giving them rapamycin currently. Uh, and uh, the idea is that we are seeing, uh, we have uh, half of those are taking rapamycin, half of them are taking a placebo. So uh, the way we give them medicine is they love yogurt. So they grab their yogurt treat and with their hand they'll, they'll eat it. So we, we put either the placebo or the, um, the, the medication uh, in their yogurt. So we are, of course, very uh, uh, concerned about their health. So they are uh, checked uh, every day by a veterinarian, all, all of them. And we are doing all sorts of assessments. One is uh, a cognition. So we are, uh, they actually learn to click iPads. So we're, we're doing assessments of the effect of the drug on cognition. One is uh, on learning. Uh, you can't see very well, but there's a learning test to your left. Also on strength, we teach them, we give them a, a hand grip uh, and they'll squeeze it. One is on, uh, on running. Uh, their exercise tolerance, so we can test that on a ball. Now they'll go and we can measure how much uh, uh, they run. So far, uh, uh, it, it hasn't, been, hasn't affected their health. The, the study's only one uh, year into the study, and it'll take us about five years to find out, uh, to get conclusive results. Uh, but so far, it does not seem to be um, detrimental. By the way, they, they also haven't. We're checking them for diabetes and it's not uh, increasing their diabetes. Um, humans, uh, well, indeed we have, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, doing uh, a study, actually we completed a small study in, in the VA with, indeed with this drug, rapamycin. The objective was to see whether it's well tolerated. So we don't want to give it for a long time until we make sure it's safe because we were giving it to healthy people. So. We're doing a, a study um, with veterans, older veterans. Their mean age is um, 80 years of age. And uh, the, um, the, the, the question was very simple. If, if we give it a, sh a short a course of this uh, drug, uh, is it well tolerated? Because if, if it is, perhaps we can begin uh, uh, longer trials. Uh, and one of the um, potential um, uses would be Alzheimer's disease because indeed in rodents it does seem to be uh, have a potent effect. And the data that uh, is shown there uh, is essentially just a comparison of rapamycin versus placebo uh, on a, a test uh, called um, um, 
the slums and taps, which is a test of cognitive function, and there was a small increase in uh, improvement in cognition. But again, this is very, very preliminary, you know, this very uh, a small study, and until the, all the data is finalized, we won't be able to make conclusions. Um, and certainly, this was just for two, uh, it was this was just for ten weeks, so we need to do a longer study. Um, but uh, at least we're encouraged to see that it was very well tolerated. Um, only a couple, one, one patient did have some gastrointestinal problems, which may or may not have been fr uh, from the drug, and another um, uh, a, a patient developed an allergy, that which very likely was from the drug. So um, we're monitoring closely, but overall we were very optimistic. Um, okay, so that is, uh, that is kind of the extreme. This, this is a drug that uh, in, has been extremely, very powerful, rapamycin and rodents. And uh, we are uh, moving to humans, but very slowly because we want to be careful. Now I'm going to talk about a, uh, another uh, intervention we're doing. And this one actually um, um, is something that um, is already in um, uh, uh, something that you can get in uh, um, vitamin stores and, uh, and uh, health, health uh, supplement stores, which is called uh, NAD, which is a type of uh, vitamin uh, B3. And you may have seen commercials or something in the air, on the airplanes that's uh, supposed to improve uh, 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 brain function and cognition. Uh, in uh, what is called mild cognitive impairment, which is a pre-diabetes, uh, a, a pre-Alzheimer's uh, pre state. Um, so uh, it, the vitamin B3 is found in, in many uh, uh, um, foods, including uh, milk. And uh, the science behind this is that um, if we give uh, this compound called NAD, uh, I, it will, uh, increase, uh, it, it will uh, improve the metabolism and the energy uh, in our brains. So uh, to your left um, is, is, so the brain constitutes only 2% of the mass of our body, but actually the brain is a, it requires a lot of energy, it consumes about 20 to 30% of all the energy uh, requirements. So it's small, but it's very uh, demanding. Uh, and the idea is that um, certainly in, in, in the laboratory that uh, there is good evidence that this uh, supplement increases um, uh, the uh, metabolism um, in, in the brain. So the idea is that by supplementing it, uh, we could potentially improve the cognition in patients that have uh, uh, an early stage of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So we are doing a, a pilot study only 10 weeks because first of all, we want to make sure that it's safe. Um, and we are en enrolling patients that are uh, over 65 and that have, uh, we're comparing patients with mild cognitive impairment, but also people that are normal. Uh, and uh, we're doing um, some uh, sophisticated tests of brain function. So in addition to doing the normal, uh, uh, usual cognitive tests that you can have done in a doctor's office, we're doing more sophisticated tests of brain function. Uh, and this is called uh, a memory task. It's, it's done in an MRI uh, machine. Um, and what you do first is that you teach uh, the patient is in the MRI and you show him a face and so this is Kevin. And then you see, Having several faces and recognize Kevin, and based if uh, if they choose the right one uh, or not, you'll get a different brain signal. So to the left is an incorrect signal, and to the right is a correct one. So this is uh, um, a very uh, precise way to see if the if what is the baseline brain function and whether your intervention is actually um, improving it. Of course, we are also doing the more uh, basic uh, assessment of, of brain function, but this is, uh, gives us a higher level of uh, precision. Um, I'm, the next one I'm gonna talk about um, is um, uh, one on uh, a study on frailty. So frailty is uh, this state in which uh, many of our older adults have. Uh, 
because uh, it is, uh, of course, associated with aging, also certain diseases like cancer uh, and infections, but the most common one, a form of frailty, is, uh, uh, is aging. Um, and pa patients that are fail, frail uh, have a very high risk of, uh, ha of having uh, bad things happen to them, uh, falls, going to the hospital, disability, and their, uh, their risk of death, uh, early death is much higher. Um, so our groups have been trying to understand uh, what are the risk factors for, uh, for frailty and to try to find a way to, uh, to uh, reverse it uh, or, or prevent it. I'm sure you have patients that are frail and you were like, oh, I wish I could have intervened or done something before they get at this stage because once someone is frail, it's very hard to, to get them back to normal function. So we did some studies and, uh, uh, and try to determine what is the main thing that predicts if someone is going to become frail. And it turned out that in our communities here in San Antonio, oops, sorry, the, the top risk factor shown there is diabetes. So someone developing diabetes uh, uh, conveys a high risk of eventually becoming frail. So based on this, we uh, designed a study using uh, a drug called metformin. Uh, who, who, who is familiar with metformin here? Yeah, so most of you, right? Because it's a, it's a drug that it is used for diabetes, but also is used for diabetes prevention. Uh, so if you can identify who, someone who's gonna develop diabetes and you give metformin, it'll decrease the risk of developing um, diabetes. So we wanted to test whether by improving the metabolism, glucose metabolism of our patients, we could, uh, someone who is frail, we can uh, slow down the progression. Or someone who is pre-frail, because there is a way to, uh, there, there are different um, 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 ways to evaluate objectively for frailty. Uh, there are different scores and tools uh, and we're using one developed by Dr. Fried many years ago that involves a measuring of walking speed, strength, uh, weight, um, and, uh, and overall well-being, and you can get a score of frailty. So the idea is to do the, the evaluation. If we find that someone is pre-frail, we would give them metformin to see whether that can prevent or slow down the, the progression of their, of their frailty. Um, so in this study, we are having people that are over 65, um, and we do uh, two types of tests. One is an assessment of frailty, and another one is an assessment for prediabetes with a glucose tolerance test. And of those that uh, we identify as having pre-frailty and prediabetes, we would enroll in the, uh, um, in, in the study. And, um, they are, we will follow them for uh, uh, two years and see whether metformin actually slows down uh, the frailty or the progression uh, to frailty. Um, now I'm going to tell you another uh, interest, interesting project uh, to me because I'm an endocrinologist. So, so uh, this is a study on oxytocin. So uh, who knows what oxytocin is? No? Okay. Okay. So oxytocin, it's a hormone that our body makes. It's made by the pituitary gland. It's actually made by the brain, transported uh, in, into the pituitary gland, and then the pituitary gland, which is a gland that we have behind our eyes, releases it into the blood. Um, w when is it most important? There are two conditions in which is really, really important, uh, particularly in, in, in women. One is this is a hormone that when um, uh, a woman is uh, going into labor, this hormone stimulates the uterus to contract. And so that, this, this is the one that is responsible. And when someone, uh, when the doctors want to induce labor and they, they put a drip, uh, this is what they're putting. Uh, and that's, this, that is stimulate uh, uh, contractions. It can also be made, uh, it can also be given intranasally with a spray. Uh, and um, I'll talk about that. And in some countries, instead of putting the drip of oxytocin, um, they, they just have the, uh, the, uh, the patient uh, have a couple of sniffs of the oxytocin and then they start contracting. The other uh, a situation which is very important is for lactation. 
So um, when a, a woman is um, giving milk to, uh, to her baby, uh, this hormone is the one that is responsible for, uh, for, um, for, uh, for lactation. Those are the two main reasons. Um, the two main situations, it's very important. Um, however, in recent years, it has become uh, apparent that uh, not only important for, um, uh, for women during uh, uh, labor and uh, for lactation, but it, we all have uh, um, oxytocin, including men, and it's higher when we're young, both men and women, and it goes down as we age. And there's also some evidence that this hormone is important for our mood uh, and for our cognition, and more recently that it's important for our metabolism and for uh, the maintenance of our, of our muscle. So um, we are doing a, a study in what is called sarcopenic uh, obesity. Now, why are we focusing in obesity uh, in aging? So it turns out that about um, 30 to 40 percent of older adults are uh, obese, ob overweight uh, uh, and obese, and this conveys a high risk of many diseases like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, et cetera. But something that it's kind of unique to aging is that while someone may be uh, obese, they, they may also have uh, what is called sarcopenia, meaning small muscle mass. So it's very common that uh, older adults, even though they're obese, they have small and weak muscles. Um, and the, we can measure that because they, uh, they are slow walkers and their muscle strength is decreased. And uh, something that um, uh, healthcare providers are very worried uh, with older adults that are obese is putting them on, um, on um, Pro, uh, weight, weight re reduction programs because there is a concern that as they're losing weight and they're losing fat, they may also be losing muscle. So um, because of the properties of, uh, of uh, oxytocin uh, that is able to reduce appetite um, and reduce weight, at, at least in rodents, increase muscle mass, we're doing a small uh, pilot study in which um, we're uh, uh, giving uh, an older adults with, that, who are obese and who have uh, sarcopenia, meaning they have uh, small muscles and they're slow walkers, we're giving them uh, a trial of oxytocin or placebo to see whether as they're lo losing weight, they are not losing muscle mass, and in fact, whether we can increase their muscle mass and their uh, muscle strength. Um, so this is a small pilot study. The, the, the idea first is, again, to check for safety uh, and to see whether it's, uh, we can go ahead with a larger study. Okay, and this is uh, really one of my last slides, um, and um, uh, that I'm, uh, um, talk about another study we're doing. So, so far I've talked about many, uh, most, uh, mostly uh, pharmacological type of interventions, which is something we're interested in. But we also, of course, understand that uh, there are other ways to uh, promote healthy aging. So we have a study on exercise, um, and uh, we will, this is a five-year study on the, the effects of exercise. Uh, we also have studies on uh, nutritional interventions, which obviously uh, are very important for, for um, the aging process, but also um, behavioral interventions are, uh, are, uh, are very important. And one of them is um, the evaluation of the stress busting program, and I think WellMed is heavily involved in, in, in this program, and uh, to see whether um, this is a program which um, involved, it's, it's a program that uh, is delivered to uh, caregivers of uh, adults that have chronic diseases, uh, Alzheimer's disease or some other chronic disease. So the idea is to intervene on the caregiver, which obviously, as you know, um, uh, is, um, un uh, is under a lot of stress and, uh, and um, uh, due to the, um, the uh, care they're, they're providing. And the idea is to intervene and improve uh, 
uh, well, the well-being of the caregiver as well. And so the stress busting program uh, is a useful uh, way to do this. So the idea of this test is to see, uh, of, uh, of this project is to see whether not only the stress busting program uh, can improve the well-being of the person that is receiving it, but also does it affect uh, certain markers in indicative of aging. Sometimes you hear how oh, the caregivers may age faster. Um, can we, so do, does an intervention to reduce uh, stress and also reduce markers of aging? Again, we can't do a 10, 20 year study so far, but we can perhaps do some measurements of biomarkers. So we're, uh, we're focusing on uh, some biomarkers. One is pH, so the acidity uh, of, uh, uh, um, of our um, fluids in our body, like saliva. This is thought to uh, uh, the pH or the acidity be related to our stress level. So we're measuring that. Also, uh, the length of uh, uh, a part of our gene, that, of our genes that is called telomeres. So those telomeres are part of our DNA, and uh, as we age, they get shorter and they're supposed to be an indicator of uh, aging and the rate of aging. So we're seeing whether it, um, this intervention uh, can affect uh, this uh, other marker of aging, as well as uh, some other uh, hormones. Um, and what we have so far in this pilot study is, um, uh, and, and actually we're also, the, another important thing is we're applying uh, in a Spanish version of stress busting uh, program to see whether there are differences uh, between Hispanics and non-Hispanics. And uh, so far, which actually, I was, uh, to be honest, kind of skeptical when I heard about this uh, pilot study uh, in terms of you know, affecting the biology. Uh, but so far, it was a striking reduction, uh, uh, well, a striking increase uh, in the pH of the saliva. So indicating that is making the saliva less uh, acidic. And again, indicating that there's, that there's actually doing something to our, our biology. Uh, and this was accompanied with uh, an improvement in other markers of, um, of uh, depression, anxiety, and, uh, and burden on the caregiver uh, burden scores. Um, so we haven't finished all the other more sophisticated uh, markers of aging, but the first one we finished, which is the pH, it clearly had a profound uh, Effect. So hopefully in the, in the near future, we'll able to uh, have more data to share with you. And again, the idea is to understand better uh, the uh, effect of these interventions to, um, to uh, promote uh, um, a, a healthier aging, not only for our patients, but our caregivers and, and ourselves. So I'm gonna end uh, with that. Uh, that's a number uh, in my email. And so I wanna thank, an, an addition to, for inviting me, uh, some members of my team, may, I think they're here, but all this research is supported. We have a very uh, uh, strong team of uh, people. I think Shea Kelly is there. I don't know of anyone else, but this study is uh, done primarily by um, our staff. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.